Dr. Weil, you know, if my son doesn't take two Advil twice a day, he can't play. What should we do? Big topic. Or again, the adults, you know, the biggest scourge in our country is pain medicine. Uh, what are those joints like? Can we prevent trouble or will you fall into the category, just again, in general, of let's wait for it to become a problem again? You know, with these kids, uh, but the rest of us, you know, with the screen time and like you said, wired, uh, sleep deprivation is a gigantic problem. Hi, this is Sifu Slim, author of The Aging Athlete. In this book, you're going to get to hear about two different groups of former high-performance athletes. One group, which is made up of 90% of the former athletes, does not do physical activity on a regular basis and tends to suffer the consequences of a sedentary lifestyle. The other group, which is made up of 10% of the former athletes, is doing physical activity on a regular basis and tends to thrive through the aging process, or at least has a better chance at coping with the aging process. We could have taken these folks to a lab and done all kinds of tests on them. Instead, we slowed them down and sat them down and asked them in their own words to describe why they're wired the way they are so that we all, former athletes and non-athletes, can use some of their inspirational and motivational and mindset lessons in our own lives. I hope you pick up a copy today. You can go to theagingathlete.com. And when you have a chance to read it, I'd love to hear back from you to find out what your thoughts are on the stories of these aging athletes. Hi there, this is Sifu Slim, and I am in Jupiter, Florida, where I was drawn three years ago in the wintertime. And it's interesting. I write books on sedentary activities and non-sedentary activities. I write books on athletes. I write the books on the idea of the balance of mind, body, and spirit. And I was drawn to Jupiter, Florida. And at the time I didn't know, but it's home of some 3,500 current like Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy part-time and Ricky Fowler, all three top uh, PGA golfers, Michael Jordan, and many of his friends come in here and visit him and play golf. 3,000, Joe Namath, 3,500 current and retired, high performance and many world-class and world-renowned athletes find their home in Jupiter. It's safe. You're driving around at 35 miles an hour, which means safe for your wife and your kids, or if you're the female athlete for your husband and your kids. And, um, and it's just a great place to be outdoors most of the year. Some are a little bit hot and, and uh, moist, but the rest of the year, just lovely to hit the beach, play golf, recreate and tennis, go to the gym, do yoga, whatever your, your interest is running. I do a lot of running here. And today I, was, I'm, I am pleased to bring on board Dr. Bob Weil, who's coming from, you'll tell us where you're coming from right now, but we have a many similar things in terms of the balance, mind, body, and spirit, and also the idea of athletes and youth athletes and how we can make them sustainable and achieve some of their goals and not abuse themselves along the journey of their athletic lifestyles. Hi there, Dr. Bob. Hey, Sifu, it's great to be on with you. Again, every, hello, everybody. Again, Dr. Bob Weil, I'm a sports podiatrist and I host the Sports Doctor. Uh, weekly uh, radio show. And again, you mentioned activities, you mentioned sports and athletes, and the, we, we talk a lot about whether it's the role of the foot in sports, or whether it is the whole uh, mental game, whether it is the challenges of, we call it the new medicine, which is eat smarter and keep moving. Uh, however, we want to prevent problems. We want to prevent injuries. And we're interested in enhancing performance so, so Sifu, the idea of uh, being able to continue to help educate, whether you're a great grandma or a superstar, uh, this is what uh, the sports doctor is all about. Wonderful, Dr. Bob. Thanks for that intro. Where are you located currently? I am in Chicago. Uh, of course, I practice my New York accent at least <laughs> once a week. I'm a New Yorker. 
but I've been here since uh, podiatry medical school, gosh, 50 something years. Uh, so yes, I am uh, uh, in Chicago, looking forward to the kind of weather that you were just bragging about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, come and visit us in the wintertime. There are plenty of you. athletes. I'm sure they could use help with their gait and their posture, all related to the foot and the the mind's connection to the foot. That's something I have not talked with anyone about. How is the mind connected to the foot? Is there a, or a couple of sentences you wish, you wish to share about that connection? Uh, again, the song, the foot bones connected to the ankle bones, connected to the knee bone is really so much where it's at. So the mind connection again is paying attention to how your body feels. And if you're dealing with persistent lower extremity concerns, your back, your knees, your feet and ankles, then what shoe you're in, your biomechanics, all are very, very important to try to, again, do the same thing we talked about briefly, which is just to prevent problems uh, and uh, also to be able to enhance uh, health and wellness. Uh, and and uh, so that mind connection is very important by paying attention to how you're feeling and how your body's feeling uh, so that you could uh, be your best self. So when, when I meet people who are in the life in the fast lane, which I also call life in the busy lane, they've got so many emails, so many Excel spreadsheets open, and then they've got their kids calling, their significant other calling, their, their parents may be calling, and then their 50 phone calls a day in all their billable hours or their research projects, or what, whatever it is, they just seem so busy all the time. And, and they said, what do you do? And I said, I teach people how to connect and balance out all of those things. So yes, you can achieve the success, productivity and performance that you want, but you're not at the end of the day feeling exhausted in a negative way, which we call wired in the modern era. Some of the people like our ancestors who showed up perhaps from Europe to the Eastern seaboard, maybe New York, New Jersey, like my ancestors, they, at the end of the day, let's say it was 12 hours of, of working in a factory or a farm or a, a mechanic or whatever they were doing, maybe six or maybe seven days a week in 1898. You know, see, the, the, the topic of uh, stress. Yeah. Everybody, the guests I have on my show, wherever they are in the world, whatever their vocation or profession or interest, everybody's talking about mental health. So the things you're talking about have been multiplied times a thousand, reducing stress, paying attention to rest and recovery, balance, like you said, uh, is extremely important. The more high um, performance somebody is, uh, the more tendency is to deal with either burnout physically or mentally. The big world of youth sports where we have these, the reason I co-authored the book, Hashtag a Sports Parents, Zero, is the idea that there's an epidemic, capital letters, epidemic of youth sports overuse injuries, both physically and mentally. So what you're saying is a very, very big topic. How do I pay attention to the um, stress and its effects on me with a thousand emails and running around like a maniac and sometimes pushing these kinds of pressures on your young son or daughter athlete and then dealing uh, with uh, concerns uh, with um, uh, the idea of, um, uh, you know, Dr. Weil, you know, if my son doesn't take two Advil twice a day, he can't play. What should we do? Big topic. Or again, the adults. You know, the biggest scourge in our country is pain medicine. Well, one of the biggest. Yeah. So these things you're talking about, this balance, understanding that you need a priority of reducing stress, rest and relaxation. Um, I'm a big meditation fan. Uh, again, we have sports psychology and mental experts on the show all the time, exactly talking about, you know, how important are these concepts um, to try to uh, stay out of trouble with, uh, with burnout yeah. and just overstress? Yeah, that, that's uh, definitely, those are all topics I've spent the last 12 years researching and writing and interviewing people about. And to finish up on these ancestors, what I determined, the difference between them and the modern people in my generation, especially starting in the late 1980s, is that the end of that day, our immigrant ancestors and their kids were often so exhausted 
that they had to go to sleep within two hours after dinner. And because of that exhaustion, even if it wasn't a nice exhaustion, it was so powerful, like boot camp in the military, that they were out like a light for their six to eight to nine hours. And then they got up and did it again, whereas a lot of people in the modern era are looking at computer lights and, and TV lights and their iPhone lights until one in the morning. And then they have a less than adequate, less than proper sleep. And they wake, they, they went to sleep wired instead of exhausted and tired and not fulfilled. And then they get up and they're kind of feeling lethargic or less. And then they start with the adrenal uh, corruptor, which is coffee, often done improperly because it's a big industry. And, th and then they start that day again and they never get reset. Social media, good luck to us all. Uh, is an incredible challenge. Every psychiatrist, as well as uh, psychologist parents that I have on the sports doctor, uh, talks about the challenges with social media with their kids or on themselves. I mean, chiropractors today, one of the biggest things they deal with is neck problems because of people looking at screens and whatever. So it's a whole new ball game. And the idea of being, again, so overwired uh with uh yeah it used to be if you were a doctor you needed to carry a pager or you needed to be available you know i had a gigantic phone that was in my glove compartment you know now everybody is always available so the problems of uh again with youth with bullying the problems with these kinds of concerns again with people uh, and all aspects of social media, this uh, nobody knew how to how to spell the word social media. So I think we need to intelligent, intelligently adapt. And one of my favorite uh, two word phrases for individuals who are trying to be active uh, is intelligent rest. In other words, if you're hurting, back off. If your son or daughter needs pain medicine over the counter to participate, you're over the line. And again, the social media challenge, I think we're still trying to deal with um, uh, try th these kinds of challenges, you know, with these kids, uh, but the rest of us, you know, with the screen time and like you said, wired, uh, sleep deprivation is a gigantic problem. And a lot of it is, again, just uh, uh, over, you know, a hundred years ago, you got the news if somebody sent a pigeon message, for example, now you hear the story 46 times a day um, and, and uh, good luck to us. Yeah. So you were asking me before we started recording with some things about myself. And I, I was thinking about how I do what I do, which is, let's say, a morning workout between an hour and a half and two hours. But it's not all heavy duty. Some days a week, it might be a little more heavy duty, but it's a really balanced program that brings in a little bit of Jack LaLanne, a little bit of Bruce Lee, a little bit of yoga and Pilates and functional training, you know, Jack LaLanne, stretching, uh, hanging, all these things. Yes. And then variety is the name of the game. Times a week, and then some high intensity sprints, blah, blah, blah. And so the way I do, I do my exercise program and the way I coach people is keep it varied in your, in your daily practice. And then make sure you do that every morning, because I've, I've met very few people percentage wise that after a long day of getting up food, work, commute home and, you know, food during the day that can have energy at six or seven o'clock at night to do a nice balanced exercise program. God bless the people who are doing it continue. But most people I found, including me, if I have to wait to the end of the day, it's much easier to skip it than if I do it in the morning right when I wake up. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Bob? I, again, everybody's an individual. Some people are morning people. Some people are evening people. We say to people, you know, relax. Don't end up with the, whether you're going to work out or not, being a, a bigger hassle. You, you mentioned Jack Lane. Elaine Lane, who just celebrated her 96th birthday, was on my radio show a few months ago because of the book. The story of Jack Lane, Pride and Discipline, just came out these past uh, few weeks. Uh, with all of his uh, 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 initiations into the world of, of fitness, uh, overuse injuries, repetitive motion injuries are a big problem. So getting into cross training, including uh, uh, the ability of um, variety is very, very important. So again, somebody might do aerobics. Uh, if everybody walked 
every day, uh, we would reduce, you know, obesity and childhood obesity is a bigger problem today as they were when I first started talking about it 25 years ago. So the idea of circuit training, uh, my famous late colleague, Bob Guida, another champion of sports medicine, uh, really, really talked so much about circuit training, which was to do different body parts, even if you kept moving, in order to add an aerobic uh, addition. So mixture and variety is very, very important. Um, where somebody might do resistance or weight training a few times a week, they might be doing a walking or jogging program. If it's not something you enjoy, you won't do it. So we tell people there's a million different activities. Yoga, talk, talking about mind-body. Uh, this week I have on Teresa Power, who just celebrated the seventh anniversary, Thiru, of the uh, International and National Kids Yoga Day. 33 countries, 200,000 children learning to include mind-body into their everyday activities. Uh, so many times, again, we see there's lots of activities. Some people enjoy swimming. Uh, again, it, uh, walking is one of the safest, one of the most uh, 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 popular and advantageous uh, to families can do it uh, together. So I think you need to know, you know how your body responds. You know, if you're sore all the time, you're overdoing it. You know, Unless one of the biggest you're not doing enough recovery. You may be pushing too hard. And, and as we age, I, I turned 59 this year. I know that I'm different than I was last year. And maybe in my age 25 to 28, not a lot of changes. But now each year is a new thing. You know, more arthritic tendencies, more stiffness tendencies, Wear less and recovery. And I'm doing so much right that I don't know how other people who are 59 that aren't doing things right are living pain free because it's it's an, it's not an easy task. No, and I, the idea again is that wear and tear is very, very important. And uh, we just don't want to be dealing so many chronic, ongoing, persistent problems, uh, especially in the world of running or jogging, as an example. Start off as simple uh, concerns that if people didn't try to push through it, if people didn't try to use medication to get through it, wouldn't become a chronic persistent problem. So again, rest and recovery is a gigantic, very, very popular topic today. Tell me your first name again, because I just S escaped. Sifu. Sifu. Now I, I got it. Now I got it, Sifu. I, I, uh, I think, again, the things that you're talking about are so very, very important, uh, you know, because again, the idea of trying to stay active safely, I call it the terrible twos. Sifu, too much, too soon, too aggressive, where we, these are some of the biggest problems we see. People start a new exercise program. They're all excited about what you're telling them and they overdo it yeah. or the coach overdoes it. I can't tell you how many youth coaches, Sifu, that I deal with that my biggest concern is overkill, just too much and being too aggressive so these are things we need to pay attention to when we're dealing with all areas, all levels of uh, sports medicine. Yeah, I, I believe in, in, in that premise that you just detailed. And I'll, I'll give you one anecdote. As a friendly gesture and as a connecting way of between me and a, past, a pastor at a church who was very much uh, involved, I would say to the point of the extreme on the day-to-day -day working of his congregation, the church, the building, and then any response that needed to be handled. He didn't outsource very well. He took it all upon himself. So he was a medium build. I'm an ectomorph thin build. And he was a medium build. And every year he would just gain maybe two pounds, three pounds. And pretty soon his full forearms, which were pretty darn muscular, they became full fat forearms, like maybe a, a a butcher in a cartoon. So his whole body just kind of filled in everywhere. And so he hadn't exercised in ages. And he, I invited him out. And I, I said, look, what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you the structure and the exercises, but we're going to work on your technique. And the whole idea of that, this is an invitation. It's a gift from the universe coming through me to you. And we're not going to push anything. 
but I'll show you some of the things that I do that eventually you may work up to, right? So when I showed him just how I do the advanced technique, he wanted to do the advanced technique because he'd been sedentary for ages. I said, no, the agreement was, we're gonna show you how to do it. We're gonna listen to your body and I'm gonna introduce you to these things, but then we're, it's a step-by-step -step progression. Just hey, like more is better. Garden. More, more is, is betting, Sifu. You know, the idea again that uh, more is better, that no pain, no gain, still are important challenges uh, today when we're dealing with uh, why do so many people uh, who get started on some sort of exercise or fitness or wellness program quit? Yeah. And many times that's one of the challenges is the idea that you're just um, uh, pushing too hard and uh, getting perspective. You mentioned the key word, technique. It's very important that people understand how important proper technique is. Again, from my perspective as a sports podiatrist, do you or your children have flat feet? Do you have high arches? Are you bow-legged? Do you have one leg longer than the other? Uh, do you have knocked knees? All of body mechanics are very important and often are ignored. One of the most important things I look at when I'm screening somebody, whatever the sport is or their age or level, I'm interested in how well you balance on one foot uh, and whether or not you're stable. So again, as you start an activity, if you don't have proper technique, then you have much more of a chance of, of having, you know, having trouble. You know, besides, again, that more is better mindset. You know, Sifu, come on, you know, I want to I, I wanna get going here. I want to run 10 miles a day like you do. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, these kinds of, of challenges, uh, instead of, again, you know, the mind-body connection, yeah. the, the idea, again, like yoga, the whole spiritual side, of that mind-body connection. Again, every health club in the country today is paying very, very big attention to relaxation classes and helping to reduce stress as more and more of the population understands. And I think the pandemic you know, exploded this in our face, whether we uh, liked it or not. Uh, the idea that stress uh, you know, was, was, was such a big deal and that we needed to at least make a priority of, of paying attention to it. Uh, what fun is an exercise program if it's always uh, causing discomfort? I, I go to gyms, Dr. Bob, occasionally. I'm normally an outdoor fitness person. Even if it's wintertime, I, I might be in my ski outfit with my warm duds on and my gloves outside doing as much as I can on a place that's got maybe the snow's not four feet, but it's only six inches. And I'm out there as much as I can, just like you're on Walton's Mountain. You don't stop going outside because it's winter time. You know, you stay out as much as you can, like you when you're a kid and, and like I did as a kid. Our mom gave us some galoshes and we were out most of the day until, until lunchtime on Saturday. So I, um, I was thinking about the last time I was in a gym, I saw a, a personal trainer and I have a certificate in that, but I think about the personal training scenario a little bit differently than a lot of the trainers that I've met. And they, they were coaching an obese, very large person who didn't have good balance about the, the deal where you pick up the giant two pieces of rope and you're swinging these right. things to get your body going. And I'm saying, how much fun is that? For me, I'm fit. For Jacqueline, who is fit, how much is it for a new person? It's not fun for me. It's a, it's a hard work, but it's, it's not very fun. Like dancing to me would be a lot more fun than that rope. And they're taking this obese, dysfunctional, imbalanced person, and they're teaching them this rope exercise. How, that's in their unconscious mind that the workout is really hard and not fun. What do you think about that? Well, I think, again, an intelligent mixture makes a lot of sense. And they might have seen that that particular exercise was included. Uh, maybe after he left the rope, he went and he balanced on the BOSU, or he stood on tilt boards, or he did some rubber bands. Um, uh, one of the chapters in my book is called the two essential exercise concepts with kids in mind, but it's the, the age is irrelevant. The idea doesn't replace everything, but we want you to include a couple of things. One is strengthen your feet and ankles, like with rubber bands, and the other is working balance. So if that exercise is something that is, you know, gee, the guy gets home, his shoulders are killing, he quits. 
So many times the personal training and personal training has come a long, long way. Life coaching, which didn't exist, has, has come a long, long way. Mm -hmm. and, and yet the competence of the coach or the personal trainer is very, very important to not cause more trouble, you know, where, including so in the might, mind. Uh, well, I, a lot in the mind. You know, a lot in the mind, which is, uh, you know, Little League Baseball, famous Little League Baseball, you know, 25, 30 years ago, woke up one day and someone said, you know what, 40 percent of the kids don't resign up. What's going on here? The point was they weren't having fun. It was too much parent pressure to win and all this other stuff. Uh, and again, the mind, you know, in youth sports, are, are, is your son and daughter enjoying what they're doing? Whose goal is it? Or, again, that idea of the program that you're introducing to your clients, whether they are a great athlete or whether they are, again, a senior, senior citizen. You know, one of the biggest topics today, uh, Sifu, is preventing falling in seniors and super seniors. So, again, balance. What's the best shoe? Et cetera, et cetera. Very, very important. All of these things can be included uh, with mind connections, attitude, you know, the famous Earl Nightingale, <laughs> he said the famous word, and it was attitude. Yeah. And when you think about it, it makes so much sense. Whatever you happen to be doing, if your attitude ain't good, uh, you're not going to get the benefit. If anything, it might even be negative. It's a huge problem. Yeah. It's a huge challenge. I don't want to use the word problem. Uh, that's why I commend individuals like yourself. Sifu, who are paying attention to these connections. And as long as I've had the show, we've included uh, these kinds. It's interesting, a quickie story. I specialize, again, in orthotic therapy and figure skating is one of my super interests. And one of my famous, famous um, athletes, uh, young uh, Evan Lysacek, uh, who was uh, in 2010, men's Olympic figure skating gold medalist, was 10 years old when I put orthotics in the skates. I'm still putting orthotics in 10 year old skates. Uh, uh, but my point was I had his mom on the radio um, a few months after he won the Olympics. I can't believe it's 12 years already. And I said to Tanya Lysacek, how did you know it wasn't your goal? It was Evan's goal. And she said, you know, Dr. Bob, he had ice time at 6.15 in the morning and I never had to wake the kid up. There he was in the car with his gloves on. Hey, Ma, let's go. I yeah. said, you know, if I was writing a book, I couldn't come up with a better answer. You know, again, the idea of, uh, of where do these things fit in regarding somebody's ability to stick with your nutrition advice, for example, or to stick with your exercise advice. Yep. Uh, that, that mental uh, component um, is, is, is a major key, uh, even when you, we're talking about um, the best in the world. I, I just was thinking as you shared the figure skating story, there, people in my generation learned from their parents, and I'm sure my dad learned from his about this idea of hard work. And hard work, I'm starting to think it might not be the right term to share with people, not that it's a negative, but there might be a better way to put it that if this is your goal, these are the steps you have to take along the way. And these are the intentions like your figure skater story, his intention by his natural uh, desire was to put that time in to achieve a, a improvement. And yes. maybe he had a goal in mind. You can and tell me more about his goal. Well, Sifu, no, nobody worked way. harder, but a good point with semantics. Maybe we should say efficient work, or we should say a productive work compared to that term hard. Yeah. Interesting point, Sifu. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. When you take somebody and you tell them how hard life is, we often tell that to, to each other and to our, our kids. Instead of that, we say, if this is your choice, like, you know, you, the kid doesn't want to eat their vegetables. They say, well, you can, you can eat the asparagus or you can eat the peas. It's your choice, kid. And the kid, child psychology is like, oh, I get a choice. Well, I'll take the asparagus, right? So if your choice is to get better at something, and the kid has a, a wide variety, I hope, of options, whether it's five or 50, 
And you, if you want to improve in this and excel and be on that team with your friends, these are the steps that you could take. It doesn't guarantee you're going to be on that team, but these are the steps you could take. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it at dinner every night to, if you're open to it to see how you're doing on that day's activities. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that idea of slow progress, Dr. Bob? I think it makes a lot of sense. It's safe, slow progress, you know, productive, slow progress. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote my famous late sports psychologist, Jim Vickery, when he would talk to parents and coaches. And his number one rule was for sports parents, whether they're sitting around, they have to practice, whatever, is don't be a critic. You know, he would talk about those kinds of uh, concerns, you know, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, didn't you learn what you were told and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, again, that idea of attitude and or balance really becomes very, very important uh, when uh, so many young boys and girls don't stick with their particular sport. You know, as a sports medicine doctor, sports podiatrist, uh, we want every young boy and girl to play multiple sports and to not necessarily specialize very, very early on one sport, whether it's tennis, whether it's soccer, whether it's figure skating or gymnastics. But a chapter in my book is called The Prodigy Sports, which are those are examples of that. Yeah. You know, we know that we should be playing everything else, but this is what he really, really loves. This is what she really, really loves. So I think those conversations around the dinner table uh, regarding uh, those concepts of health and wellness and the concepts even of high achievement or uh, where we're talking about uh, kids who are 11, 12, 13 years old. When you, we watch the Olympics, which we just did, both the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics, wasn't it amazing that mental health yeah. was the biggest topic? Yeah. Whether it was Simone Biles or whether it was the Russians with the, you know, giving kids performance and enhancing drugs. So I, I think parents and coaches need perspective or personal trainers and life coaches when it comes to um, advice yeah. regarding your particular exercise program. Yeah, the tennis player who was top in the world, Osaka from Japan, uh, she couldn't handle the, the, all of the interviews after her tournaments and she left the uh, French Open yes. two or three years ago and she said, I grew up texting and on the internet. I didn't grow up with these large groups or small groups of people where there was lots of interaction and I'm not comfortable with it. I love to play tennis. I love to smile and maybe make a speech if I win, but I can't do the 20 and 30 minute barrage of interview questions, even if that's part of the contract. It's my mental health. Very, very difficult. Risk. And she, what started that really exacerbated it. People might remember when she won the uh, US Open, she beat Serena Williams. Serena Williams was in this controversy, this yelling match yeah. with the referees, yeah. all of this back and forth. Yeah. And Osaka, who basically broke down, was embarrassed. Serena was one of her idols. Yeah. And she beat her in this whole hoopla. And it, it, this is one of the contributing factors to what she was dealing with. Um, to say, let alone if you're Simone Biles and everybody's expecting perfection in, in, in every aspect. But when you're watching these young superstars and one of the, one of the uh, most famous women tennis players who was labeled with burnout a lot of a career, was a patient of mine, was Tracy Austin in, in the 80s. Uh, and, and these pressure that, that are uh, put on these kids uh, when we, we talk about, is anybody ready for this, you know, this kind of uh, scrutiny, yeah. and uh, this is not for everybody. And sometimes we'll understand that uh, uh, people will start breaking rules and uh, causing all sorts of different uh, concerns. By the time, again, you watch the Olympics with a 16, 17, 18 year old performing, you know, they were five or six or seven year old years old when they started. And hey, this is very, very special, but it ain't for everybody, to say the least. I, I wrote down um, some ideas I had that a, a dentist shared with me a long time ago. They, they learned to look holistically as an organization, the American Dental Association, back in the early 70s, which was very commendable, they, they came up with a slogan that a mouth doesn't walk into, into their office, a whole person does. 
So I wondered if the podiatry community says, hey, a foot doesn't walk into our clinic, the whole person does. Is that, is that something you've heard or thought about? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a very, very important concept. Regardless of any physician-patient relationship, the whole person, coach, uh, athlete, coach, client, coach, parents, very important. It's funny you mentioned dentistry. Uh, the uh, alignment device for the jaw, a mandibular device, when I've had them on my show, which I have, we would compare to orthotics and shoes. Alignment. Uh, the uh, idea, again, of uh, the precision of performance or preventing trouble. But yes, the whole person, very, very, that great slogan for my, my dental friends. <laughs> I, I agree um, with it. I, I've had uh, many people, including myself, have problems of the foot. I don't know anyone who hasn't had a problem of the foot, but maybe they are out there. I wrote down a, a list of things that I would ask them about if I was doing some wellness coaching. I said, okay, biomechanical, shoe, injury, posture, gait. Then I wrote down nerve and neurological. Then I wrote down inflammation and then diet and gut microbiosis, microbiome. I wrote down parasite and I wrote down stress and psychological. Is there anything I didn't Put on that list that I should. Uh, I, it's already, it's, a, it's almost intimidating. By the time people listen to the end of the list, they might leave you. Uh, but, you know, the idea again, when you're talking about any, all of these aspects, what's your personal history, Sifu? If we're talking about, you know, I've never had foot ankle problems. You know, my knees have never bothered me on my back. You know, uh, I've always had knee trouble. Uh, many times, again, if you have persistent lower extremity problems, Look at the feet. You can be a, a, a superstar with flat feet, but 85% of the problems I see in podiatry are pronated and excessive pronated flat foot type related. So many times it's a weak link. So I get back to that important point of somebody's history. All the different things you talked about, whether it's gut health, uh, whether it is uh, uh, people's uh, uh, perceptions or attitudes uh, in all of these areas, um, again, have a lot to do with when you sit down and you discuss their history, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, what kind of problems have you had? And then you can start um, paying uh, a big attention. You know, another pearl from the sports doctor for you guys, you know, still to this day, the famous ACL knee injuries are five or six to one females to males. And a lot of it is biomechanical. A female has wider hips, a different angle down to the knee, and females, their hormones, as they develop the idea of some laxity, a little bit more flexibility in the, in the body, uh, there's nowhere near enough attention to the role of orthotics when it comes to helping Many of these, you know, you mentioned posture various times. If you have any of the imbalances that I mentioned, uh, whether it's one leg shorter than another, which is much more common uh, than we uh, assume, or whether it again is that, you know, I'm looking at this kid, he's got these high arches. No wonder he always has shin splints because his foot is not an effective uh, shock absorber. For example, again, we get back to that individual history and then being able to uh, look at preventative measures. And as many of those preventative measures have a lot to do with a lot of your, you know, see for your attention to the mind-body uh, connection. I, I find that those, again, are just as important when you're dealing with the whole person. Uh, again, this might be the best athlete in the world in this sport, yet the mental things are such a... You know, what about the twisties? Who ever heard of the term twisties until Simone Biles said, you know, I'm not confident of where I am in this triple or quadruple jump. And I, I just can't. This was wow. You know, somebody with this kind of training and this kind of attitude would make us all understand what a big deal. Yeah. Uh, this is what did they call it in golf? You know, you mentioned golf. The uh, yips. The up, exactly. The yips. Uh, being so much mental and then becoming even a, a, a bigger deal when it comes again to the physical side. Yeah. Remember, these, in pro sports, men and women, in high school and college sports, see who, bigger, faster, stronger. 
and the female athlete, it just is, is remarkable. You know, we just, uh, I think we celebrated the 50th year of Title IX, uh, sometimes very, very recently. And I'm marveling every day at the athleticism. Uh, and, but every sport is bigger, faster, stronger. And this is why preventing injury is, uh, is such a big deal. And you got to pay attention to that, if that, that individual's history when you're putting together a plan for them or your advice. Love it, love it. Um, Dr. Bob, when you were speaking, I thought about a, a topic that's on my mind, but I haven't researched. It's just been kicking around in my mind for years. And it's the idea of if we're out on a farm, whether it was I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, or I go out to a farm now and it's a horse doing the horse's thing, which is occasionally going on and a run along the a mountainside all, all by himself or herself, right? And they're running and we look in that, that grace and that beauty in motion. And we say, isn't that a wonderful picture on that hillside with a weeping willow over here and the sun over here? And we watch that horse doing that, but there's no monetary reward unless somebody charges us as tourists to go up and watch horses or something like that. There's a connection between a a, a financial gain and a, and a piece of beauty. Um, same horse racing, you can get paid if you, if you win a competition in, in speed uh, or some other horse jumping competition or what have you, you might be able to make money or sponsorship. Same thing with athletes. I love watching 12 year old athletes who know what they're doing uh, playing tennis better than I could, you know, better than I could with 20 years of lessons. They, they have such a natural ability, some of these young people. I said, isn't this a beauty? But that kid might not be able to get the scholarship to college or get any type of a professional uh, job unless they start doing some winning along the way and they, and they do things differently than the, just the beauty in motion. So have you thought about this idea that I'm discussing? Oh, yes. Watch the, you know, Will, Will Smith being in the news like he is, but the, the whole subject of the uh, uh, Williams sisters and uh, their dad being their coach and his tremendous values and the idea of then being able to implement uh, the idea. You know, what do you mean your kids aren't on tour and what do you mean they're not in tournaments? And uh, very, very early on, even though people thought he was nuts, and we dealt with all of these superstars with my famous late colleague, Bob Guida, uh, who worked so much with Nick Boletari's Academy, with the Pete Sampras's and the Andre Agassi's. Uh, tennis was always one of these prodigy sports, you know? And like Guida would say, if you're swinging a tennis racket a thousand times a day, you better strengthen the muscles that slow it down. Or that he'd say, train those opposites, work, work the brakes. Oh. So uh, again, you have uh, the, again, like a movie where they're talking about the, those kinds of inclusions, the necessary inclusions. What do you mean your two girls who became the best in the world, like he said they would, haven't played any competition? We're at younger and younger ages. And yet, again, that was added in like he talked about the experience of winning or the experience uh, of hard work. Right. But like you mentioned racehorses again, on the negative side is the over, you know, the horses on drugs yeah. and the idea of uh, so many injuries and all of these things because of overkill and overuse. It's no different uh, with uh, us or you, uh, as well, again, whether it is uh, million dollar athletes, and, you know, I have team physicians on my radio show all the time. Uh, Chris Ahmad from the Yankees, Brian Cole from the White Sox and Bulls is an example, talking about what about those pressures, you know, where the athlete says, don't you understand? I got to play yesterday. And, you know, this is where, you know, I'll throw this in the uh, performance enhancing drugs, all the cheating. We watched it in the Winter Olympics with a 15 year old. But I'll tell you the reality. I renamed performance enhancing drugs 10, 15 years ago, performance surviving drugs. The idea again of taking pain medicines to try to somehow survive or stay in the game and the mental pressures that are on, whether it's the doctors who are treating these athletes, whether it's the parents, of these young athletes or their coaches, you know, don't you understand Dr. Wall? She's got competition next week. If she doesn't take the Advil, the yeah. knees are killing her. 
So this is the culture uh, that we're in. So interesting concept you brought up, you know, the idea of where does, you know, the idea of learning how to win, for example, being one of the ingredients that would need to be included for this youngster uh, in order for them to somehow achieve, you mentioned the scholarship. You know how many athletes become professionals? It's one out of millions. Yeah. And a lot of times parents don't understand, but you got the scholarship on the line or being on that traveling team and the pressures from parents or coaches. This is a very big problem today in the big business of youth sports. And it's also a big deal, uh, for instance, with your adult, adult clientele who might be, uh, like it sounds like you, uh, you know, real achievers. You know, uh, what's your attitude going to be like if you're down with an injury for a couple of months, Sifu? I'm I, asking I, you. I had, <laughs> I, I was in Croatia two summers ago and just on a casual grabbing the roots on the side of the bank of, of the little river, I was just popping in. So maybe three foot drop nice and easy into the water and my, um, my bone, uh, what's the little hook that grows out on the plantar, plantar fascia hook? Oh, oh you're talking about a bone spur? Bone you're spur. talking about on the foot? Yeah, bone spur. Yes. Uh, I, I already had a feeling I had them. I'd already been doing a lot of therapeutic exercise and stretches for my plantar fascia and hip exercises and biomechanical things. And then uh, didn't have any problem running, doing my sprints because I was doing all that other therapy. And But I jumped in and I landed on a rock not very hard, but at a right angle that it really hit that bone spur, that heel spur. And I was um, in discomfort for the next eight months. And I, I had a feeling this thing was never going to go away. I, I just, my mind Well, said, bone hey, spurs, for instance, in plantar, plantar fascia is the band-like substance goes from the toes to the heel on the bottom of the foot. It's a tendon tissue, constant traction where it attaches to the heel, irritated, uh, inflamed, pulled, stretched. Every step we take, we use that area. Uh, and the bone responds over the years into our 40s and 50s many times and a spur forms. Uh, not all spurs hurt. It's the process many times that hurts. So I'm hoping you, Sifu, my friend, wear a prayer of custom orthotics that'll, that'll help your I'm, problem big time. I'm flying out <laughs> to Chicago next week. I hear you. Uh, again, the, the uh, takes years for a spur to form. Now, again, the stretching you'd be doing and the strengthening that you're doing, get on those rubber bands, you know, get on those. Ones. They're one of the greatest pieces of equipment. It's called the sand dune stepper. Sand dune stepper is a piece of equipment that simulates being on the sand and the gripping of your feet and the working of those muscles in your feet, these kinds of exercises can be very, very good. Uh, but many times your mechanics over your whole life is what can cause yeah. that problem. So your bad luck in landing on that rock or whatever and hitting that area and all of a sudden, something that might've stayed quiet now is, is a problem because it's of the fact up. that the condition, the con big time, proper support of the arches almost always is productive. But the difference between a custom orthotic, which is about joint alignment, and it's like a contact lens for your feet, is the gold program. Often an over-the-counter support, having to do sometimes also with the types of shoes that you're wearing, uh, a lot of times it is relevant. Because if I asked you how much running, how, how much mileage do you do, and how many days a week do you run, what would you say? I would say I run three times per week. How many miles? Four miles a pop. Excellent. You know, you're right out of the book. That's one of the safest kinds of schedules. It's smart. It's every other day. It's only three days a week. It allows you to do these other exercises and programs in between. And it's not like you're running 15 miles six days a week where we start running into other kinds of problems. So, uh, uh, you know, a commendability from the sports doctor for your three days a week, four miles a clock, uh, at a clock. <laughs> I am happy to announce that my uh, plantar fascia, my heel spur pain 
subsided and all in one day. I, I didn't feel like it was a gradual decline. It all in one day, it decided not to throb anymore and bother me. And it was like a gift. And I said, hey, thank you universe for, for granting me that. And I'm back in action, but I'm going to be ever more mindful. Prevention. If I go in the rivers, I'm not going to walk on rocks. Well, I'm going to no. wear some prevention sort of if you're, on my foot. Yes. If you're a runner, then you want to pay big attention to what we're talking about. The role of seeing a podiatrist, getting that insight. Are you in the best shoe for you and your foot type? Again, that history. Uh, where is the spur? Uh, what are those joints like? Can we prevent trouble? Or will you fall into the category, just again, in general, of let's wait for it to become a problem again and ruin your running? Uh, we've had so many patients, again, who were, uh, uh, because about 5 to 10%, roughly, of plantar fasciitis, which is the most common problem we see, Sifu, in active people. Inflammation of the arch, or commonly its connection to the heel, is the most common problem we see, and about 5% of these problems are a real hassle, where injections, uh, the necessity of uh, uh, even when orthotics are used and even when physical therapy is used, this person's still having a problem. Maybe 1% of them might be surgical problems. So again, the idea of prevention is very, very important for you to get that kind of feedback uh, and get, uh, have uh, uh, the, the podiatry opinion because uh, uh, orthotics is one of the best weapons you have uh, in order to control the kind of traction uh, that is part of that problem. Because right now we'll say you're lucky. Uh, I'm rooting for you. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed. Um, one, one, one or two more questions and we'll let you get back to your, your busy day and your sustainable balance day also. Um, I would say uh, the idea of damage is really important. So when somebody, I've been to doctors that taught me back exercises and stretching exercise. I have a very long back. My height at six foot three is mostly in my upper back. Uh, sorry, lower back. I got extended and I have a long neck. So I had to, they were teaching me at age 10 and 12 from various injuries, abdomen and back exercises, neck stretching, and, and I've done them. And when I start coaching people through an injury that they have, and I show them some exercises to help heal the energy, uh, that injury and and make it uh, you know, a little bit stronger the next time around and teach them a warm up and a cool down for that area. I said, what I do with my therapeutic exercises that people have taught me for my um, base, my base uh, default biomechanical issues, I do those exercises as part of my routine a little bit every day. And that's my therapy of prevention and efficiency. I said, so I think that's what people should do for a car accident, you know, they go in and they got whiplash and they show them some things and they do that for two or three yes. months and Core. Then they don't do it again. But then they've got that, that sore area that will rear its angry head because they're not doing any therapeutic exercises as a, a part of their sustainable life. What are your thoughts on that? No, I agree with you totally. And a lot of times we see that the uh, uh, core again, when I first met Bob guide in the late seventies, medicine didn't know how to spell the word core. No one really talked about it uh, and how important it was, regardless of what sport you played or regardless of, of your body type. The idea that strengthening the core and all the muscles that support it had so much to do with um, not only staying out of trouble, you know, half our country's plagued, plagued with back problems and low back problems. People who sit too much, people, again, you mentioned the word posture. So, Many times seeing a good physical therapist, uh, uh, really finding out what's the best type of, of preventative exercises for me yeah. and my body type that I could practice every day makes sense. Again, technique is a key. So often we see that people can get off, if you're doing the wrong exercises and the wrong, or overdoing it, then you're not necessarily achieving the goal you have, yes. you know, which is you know, uh, uh, being proactive. Yeah. You know, the famous word, prehab, which is to do the kinds of, and getting feedback of a good physical therapist is one of the best ways uh, in order to get a good home program for you to include 
Uh, I have, again, have tremendous regard for the chiropractic profession. Again, along all those lines, the importance of the spine is such a big deal. Again, there's not a serious team or athlete who doesn't include a chiropractic colleague on their um, sports medicine team. And the sports medicine team today is a big deal. It's got like 15, 20 components uh, of specialties, uh, psychology being one of them, Sifu. I, one last thing, and then we'll part. But first, share how people can get a hold of you, Dr. Bob. SportsDoctorRadio.com uh, is my website. If people go to radio shows, they can go back years. What were the topics? What they might want to listen to? Whatever they like, they go over to newspaper articles and magazines. They can read an endless array of the articles we contribute with MVP Magazine, Lower Extremity Review. I have thousands and thousands of followers on Twitter. I can't tell you how many guests I get from Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and we have a lot of great, good sports medicine information, health and fitness information at Sports Doc, D-O-C Radio. But they can get all those links uh, if they go to sportsdoctorradio.com, Sifu. Thanks, Dr. Bob. So I'm, I'm Sifu at Sifu, S-I-F-U, slim.com. And I wanted to share one last anecdote and, and ask you as an experienced uh, medicine man for all these years, an athletic uh, type person. I have a, a contact when I was about 28 and he was 25 and he had broad shoulders. He was a, a big American dude uh, in shape. He'd be about 220 and he was a professional baseball player. Now you'd think it, being that size, he was a great hitter and he really was he had a great hitting ability and he had high average in the minors and he just made it up to the show and but his his best thing was he was great in the outfield he really had a great arm great depth perception uh, hand eye all those things and you need good communication skills to and to figure out where that hitter's going to hit it and listening skills and study all that stuff so he was the full package and one day he went out some people on his team said hey we're going out to hit batting practice there was this supplemental batting practice and i think they were in a uh, candlestick park or somewhere where it was cold and misty so it's in the morning he's not really warmed up and this was a something out of his normal practice even though he was only 23 at the time you need to warm up the body and he what he did is he took two swings and then he tore some things in his subscapularis rhomboid area and that never healed and he was off the team and then he just became a slow pitch softball guy by age 25. So that's to me, what I would have tried to teach people, learn to say no, observe things before you're going to get into them and then do, do the full warm up program like tennis ball rolling and foam rolling massage, assess where your body is that day. Don't just go out with a limited thing and start doing your, your superhuman swings at the ball because there goes your career or your health either one share what your thoughts are on that dr bob well it's like walking out of the house and just starting a run the warm-up is a key is the uh, even walking and doing a little skipping and moving around so this guy had terrible horrible luck because he might have done that a million times never pulled the torah muscle let alone one that ruined his career but the lesson there again is you you have to warm up properly uh, in order to be able to have the least chance of, uh, of an injury. He made a very bad decision in that regard. But again, whether someone walks right out the door and starts running uh, instead of being able to warm up or somebody gets into uh, action right away, they're a lot more susceptible with a cold body uh, uh, than they would be if they warm up properly. What's the best warm up? A lot of there's been a million different ideas regarding that. You know, the idea of static stretching used to be so popular in my. He learned. You, you just got cut off for the last 30 seconds. If you remember, share what you said in the last 30 seconds. Yeah, so the, you know, the idea of a uh, lesson learned, you must warm up a, a cold body, jumping right into activity is gonna be much more susceptible 
to a potential injury. So your story is a great example of uh, an unfortunate tragedy uh, that ruined his career. Yeah, and then the other thing you get out of doing a good warm-up program and stretching, you're going to assess where you are. So let's say it could happen to a 15-year-old, happen to a 50-year-old, doesn't matter. Let's say you slept a little bit funny or you went to sleep with stress and it hung out in your back or your neck and then you wake up and if, if you don't do your morning assessment and stretching, you don't know. So if you go out swinging the bat because you're a, a, a baseball hero, you haven't done your assessments. You got to see where you are at that moment. And every moment is different. Yes. Good range of motion exercises uh, many times, uh, again, make a tremendous difference. The, the idea, though, like you said, you're an educator, is the importance of people's awareness that warming up is a key point, including being mentally ready for what you're doing, you know, absolutely like you were talking about. Uh, but you just don't want to be cold. You're going to be more susceptible to injury. Uh, and this is where awareness uh, is very important for all of us. Wonderful. So uh, I'm, I'm going to put a couple of notes down and email you. I've, if you're open to another conversation for my show, and then we can talk about your show. I'm really enjoying this, Dr. Bob, and we're uh, kindred spirits. And I, and I think that there are some good more things we can flush out to, uh, to help each other and, and our pro progress of, of helping other people and then help those end users to uh, tap into some of the balance yes. and the wellness. Yeah, one of the things, aspects. Sifu, if you'd like, if you want to, for example, if you go to my website, if you go to radio shows and you just browse down, seeing who was the, uh, who were on, I usually have two guests a show. Again, the umbrella of topics is endless. You might find people of real interest uh, regarding with, in what you do. We share these kinds of information so all the time. I'll look forward to your uh, email. I absolutely uh, look to have you come on sometime in uh, May or June, something like that. And uh, uh, again, this was really enjoyable for me also. So um, I'll let Kirk, matter of fact, Kirk is coming back on with me the 20th of April. Uh, and again, he's a dynamite guy. He's done so many great things. And I, he took part in my book, by the way, the last chapter in Hashtag A Sports Parents. And just briefly, Sharky Zartman is my co-author, is a Hall of Fame beach volleyballer, national team player, host, author, et cetera. The book is, is, is broken down, and I will, I'll send you the PDF for the present. Um, Sports Parenting 101, Sharky handles in the first chapter. Second chapter section is called the Sports Doctors Inn. It's my contribution, all aspects of what we're taught from concussions to shoes to orthotics, et cetera. Third section is Ask the Experts. Eight different experts in every area, nutrition, physical training, mental training. But the last section is perspective, parents' perspectives. And Kirk's one of the parents' perspectives. Both his daughters were Division I athletes. You know, I mentioned Lindsay, the volleyballer. What was it like, Kirk, to deal with, you know, both these girls? They both got scholarships, you know, and you were a gym teacher, you know, because Kirk was an NCAA uh, a gymnastics he, he's champion. He's the Lord of the Rings. He wishes Ex that exactly. he could have gone to the Olympics just on one thing because his rings were his skill. He yes. wasn't uh, at, the, at the level on all yes. the other. He was uh, told parts. he'd never make the team. That's why his book, I reference his book all the time, Becoming a True Champion, because it really is one of the things I recommend to everybody. So I'll look forward to your uh, email and then we'll follow up. And thanks so much, uh, Sifu. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And for all the viewers out there, please give us a like. Please consider subscribing to our, our various channels and radio shows. And please leave your respectful comments below. And we'll attempt to answer them. I'm Sifu Slim right now in Jupiter with Dr. Bob from Chicago. And we wish you all the best in your health and your mind, body and spirit. Aloha. Aloha to you. Thank you.